Bill, you wanted to say uh, yes, I, I wanted to, uh, as we resume the discussion, make sure that uh, we acknowledge that we've got Executive Director Christy Taylor and uh, Staff Attorney Lamar Davis from the Judicial Court of Mental Health, uh, who have uh, raised the been sitting in. Uh, any hard questions need to go to them, uh, <laughs> but uh, we're very appreciative of all the work they do. Uh, the, the report that's uh, been circulated as part of our discussion today is just one very small facet of a tremendous amount of work. Christine and her team in terms of their missions, um, mission and goals. So thank you for participating. Uh, Bill, while, while, we're, while we're getting started, I have one question. I want to know how the Um. Yes. So this would be a cut to that as a subpart F or something? What, what, subpart, whatever the next letter is. Uh, yeah. E is the last one. Yeah. Well, I think, I, but I think, I think rule 10 with the, with the, the preliminarily approved amendments um, uh, maybe have a broader. Okay. Just wonder. Uh, right. Uh, and and may, may I make one other yeah, uh, comment? Um, I was going to um, follow up on Judge Miskell's comment about um, <laughs> attempting to rule, um, and and I think that the logic behind that was uh, uh, sometimes it may not be entirely clear what is being asked for. I don't think that would be a substantive problem, not a non. -substantive. If it's like I can't tell what you're asking for, mm -hmm. that's a substantive problem. Should rule ignoring any non substantive problems, and if it's just like I don't even know what this is, that's who's my Got thinking. It. Okay, all right. So, um, it sounds like we have a debate about whether or not, uh, most rule ought to be tight. So, so actually, I, I would suggest a, a preliminary vote on the first bracketed language before we get to the harder question or the, the more robust discussion that we've had about how mandatory or how emphatic do we want. To be. But I think that the first, the, the threshold issue would be the first bracketed language for Rule 10 uh, about whether or not um, we're going to cabin this particular proposed rule for this particular um, mental health circumstance under these particular statutes. And, um, Justice Bland has pointed out in our, during our break that this is uh, really, this proposed rule has its genesis in a specific legislative mandate. So really, Purdue should have handled it. He was... That's, that's <laughs> 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 uh, Complaining about your encroaching on his. <laughs> well, I have a ready fix for that, but we'll come back. Um, but, but returning to the main point, um, uh, I think a, a first, if, if, if we're to the point of, of, of voting, then I think a first vote would be do we want to uh, have this proposed rule cabined by these provisions? Um, and I think an answer to that would be to be within the bounds of the legislative mandate that they're responding to, that probably makes sense to have it be so limited. Certainly doesn't preclude a larger discussion uh, about rules encouraging reaching of the merits of things with regard to non-substantive defects. <coughs> Run that to ground for every complex. Yeah, okay. Uh, is there any argument? Alisa? Uh, just on principle, I just think if all rules should be, we, we need to develop, let me say not we, the court does need to be consistent with how to handle court forms and we keep, this keeps coming up and um, so I would not limit it to 573, 574, even though I do really respect um, Justice Boyce and Justice Bland's comment about this is partly a legislative mandate, which I actually had not realized, I thought it was 
recommendation just from the Mental Health Commission. Um, but I still want to be on principle, we should be treating all forms the same, whether family forms or mental health forms or any form. So that's my only comment. Uh, any other uh, comments about that? Okay. Uh, he, um, uh, we need a Apparently, apparently we do. Oh, you can just know my descent. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if you can attract any support for you. We'll be saying that so everybody's in favor of the bracket of the language. At the beginning? Yeah. The first sentence. L limiting the scope to, to under chapters 573 and 574. Put your hands up uh, online when you're when you're on Zoom. If you're voting for it. We're we're voting on whether or not to first bracket in language. Uh, Put your hands up on Zoom. You've already been. <coughs> Um, everybody opposed. It takes the people on Zoom take their hands down. Uh, and how about on Zoom? Okay, everybody uh, raise their hand that wants to. Okay. Uh, it varies by a vote at 14 to So, uh, thank you, like, that's part of our recommendation. I'll do, uh, um, if you Question of whether. Yes, I think based on the discussion that we've had, I'm not sure that we need to wrestle with second bracketed language if form is used. I, I, if I'm understanding the flow of the comments. I think the, the, the question for a vote would be should, should the current not required language use of forms is not required to be used or should there be something more mandatory and static about using forms? Yeah the suggestion is I've heard the way move the word just say give or take. I think there were two options. One is the use of the proposed forms is required, or option B was the court can't reject the uh, bill. Richard, I think we need to be careful that we don't suggest that the form must be used. For example, a lawyer may however. So be careful that the Uh, Just to reiterate that, um, there's options, therefore, but that are between the proposed language and the mandatory. 
something like approved forms um, generally be used or something that encourages their use. Yeah. We don't have just or extremes or maybe a middle. So maple. <laughs> Chip, I, I think the language is ambiguous as it's written right now. Uh, what I want is, I, I, okay, I don't want local judges to say, I'm not using these, period. You, in my court, you've got to use something else. I don't want that to happen unless they go through the process. To say why to their PJ. On the other hand, I don't want to forbid people out in the field from using something different or you know they didn't comply or it was handwritten on notebook paper as someone said, or a lawyer wants to draft it differently. If, if they get the message to the judge and it's adequate in the judge's opinion, I think that judge ought to be able to act on it. And I think this language uh, is not clear enough. I'm not sure we should draft from the floor, but that's what I am for personally. Okay. Um, anybody else? <clears throat> Mr. Redwood say that based on our experience with family law firms controversial there were some judges who said I'm not judge in my court of over a period of time, I think grown acceptance of thank you resistance everybody to get in line and uh, later on if we feel like the language is very strong we could weaken it but i do think that there will be some pockets of resistance not firm <laughs> how would you propose being firm gosh there's people who says we should draft from the floor <laughs> you've never been shy about that <laughs> i don't know i, I think that uh, i would rather hear some other Hey, Bill, and then uh, Judge Pistol. So I'm wondering if we could frame a vote around <clears throat> broader issue. Uh, we want to make it, leave it permissive like it is in the draft, or do we want something more mandatory and emphatic? And if the vote is in favor of more mandatory and emphatic, then we'll go back and digest the comments and bring back something because I'm not sure we'll be able to. Yeah, okay, that's a good point. Judge Pistol. Uh, I was just going to toss out some proposed language if that's the direction we want to go or not. But I think I'm hearing some consensus, at least as the part that courts cannot reject the forms published by the Supreme. Uh, I, I think Bill's point is well taken that maybe let's have a vote on permission uh, or mandatory in some fashion. Uh, so everybody uh, in favor of rule as currently drafted. Uh, which will we'll categorize as being permissive. Uh, raise your hand. Only there. <laughs> right. Everybody that wants it to be more mandatory in some fashion. And online. Uh, okay, so the permissive crowd uh, has come down to stunning defeat, twenty-two to five. Uh, so uh, <laughs> more mandatory it is. Uh, so now we have to come up with that bill. What's your proposal? More mandatory language. I'd like to hear some more discussion and proposals. I'm, I mean, I'm not. I'm not sure if we're at the point of voting, but what more mandatory language is like at this point or not, or whether we just bring something back to the. Are we, are, yeah, Judge. Well, I would just suggest that the next question could be whether the judge can't bring it or the judge must have it. Yeah. 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 The judge can't reject it or that you must have it. And then you can deal with how you draft it. Essentially, are we just going to. Judge cannot reject the use of it. Okay. Uh, Robert. What Judge Peoples was suggesting is that follow the 
the process outlined in less great alternative that goes to review that might be in addition to or over the approved process. That, that's not exactly have to follow the rules, but uh, allows for deviation, but not at Judge Miskell, what, what was your thought again uh, of how to do this? So I think we're looking at two categories of people using forms, judge requiring a particular form or people being forced to use a particular form and being able to use whatever form they want. And that's the two options we're deciding from. I want to say the rule is this form must be used unless you pass a different local rule under 3A, whatever, but this form must be used by the judge and by the people applying for it. Or whether you say the court can't reject the form, which means the judge must always accept it, but people can come in with whatever form they want to file. I think are the two. Yeah, Richard. I would be, as I said before, a little concerned if we say you must use, use this form. But if a lawyer doesn't use the form, or even if a pro se doesn't use the form exactly, or uses a form that's close to it but not good, then all of a sudden the judge has said, I'm sorry, but the, the rule requires you to use the form. I much prefer the approach that can't reject this form because what it says, but I think also the judge should go ahead and rule on the merits. Even if the form is a little sloppy or leaves out a paragraph or something. So I, I'm attracted to Judge Miskell's suggestion. Tell the judge you can't reject this because it's a form, but not require everyone to conform to it. Because if they don't, then you've got an argument of whether it's effective or not. Uh, Bill, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think we can wrap something up. We can either take a vote. Um, and Stan Richards' proposal to be now, or we can bring it, you know, work something up so folks can look at it in context. Yeah, let, let's let's like try to come up with some language, uh, and maybe even over the lunch hour. Okay. Uh, yeah, John. Am I missing something? I, I'm thinking it should be if if it's should be that the public should use the form because they won't have the legal understanding. They will know what they're trying. Won't have that background on how to draft it. The, um, an attorney would, so I think it would it would be less confusing if you had the requirement was more on John and Jane. Public. Sorry, if, if it was more what? If it was more, if the form was more for public use versus attorney use. I think he's arguing in favor of the must use option. Yeah. Everybody, judge and people, must use the form. And Richard against my, uh, my violently concern, against that my concern about john's suggestion is if they don't there's a justification for rejecting it because it says you must use it you didn't you're out of here that's i i, I mean i know we want to encourage people to not be creative and to pay attention to the form but we don't want to give judges a justification for rejecting something on the grounds that it didn't comply and then not addressing the merits. So let's, I just, we just feel like we need to be careful there. Well, what could you do to the form to be creatively? Well, to... I could talk all about that. We get all kinds <laughs> of jacked up forms. So. <laughs> and a lot of times the forms are by some private uh, form seller. Yeah, that is approximately okay, but not really identical. But what's the point here? The point here is to allow a pro se individual right. to get into court without having to hire a lawyer. Well, that's John's point. That's my point. Yeah, right. Uh, Lisa, um, I went and looked up um, what the court said in its order approving the protective order task force kit that we have. So we have approved forms to get a protective order, and I was just curious what the court has previously. Um, and this order, um, which uh, Justice Boyce, 2090-62, if you want to write it down. Um, use of the approved form is not required. However, a trial court must not refuse to 
accept the application simply because the applicant used the approved forms or is not represented by counsel. If the approved forms are used, the court should attempt on the application without regard to technical defects in the application. Our guys did that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Jackie. <laughs> I'll, I'll second that motion. <laughs> I, I think the chief was taking all the credit for that. that, that the smug look on his face. <laughs> Yeah, that language sounds pretty good, Justice Gray. There's a similar requirement in Rule 145 uh, about the use of the sworn statements. That would be another resource to look at as a source for the option, the, the use of the form in substantially correct uh, phrasing. Yeah, great. Well, uh, I would say that is a template, but over like bring it back to the I, I, I will be glad to do that with the observation that it sounds fairly close to the proposal yeah. that we voted to make. So I'm, I'm a little uncertain. Well, that's because Lisa was tardy and up with that uh, change the vote by Richard. So, Bill, are you saying more mandatory on the pro se or more mandatory on the judge? Judge. To me, more mandatory on the judge is good. More mandatory on the pro se is bad. That's my that makes bottom sense. line view. Yeah, read it into the record. We have a written comment to be read into the record. She just wants to get up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, judge Stryker, maybe the court should rule on the requested request as long as all substantive requirements and challenges. 573 or included motion without regard to non substantive form of the filing. Okay. That's in the record. So we got that. Uh, all right. Any other comments about this? Bill, while we're just talking about it over lunch. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to take a swing in some language. It's always easier to. You know, talk about specific right. language. Uh, okay, so that's rule 10. Uh, do we want to talk about the forms? I, I would invite any comments that anybody wants to make about specific language used in, in attempt to make plain language forms. I know Kenan had uh, suggested some particular change. If there's anything you want to highlight, Kenan, you can do that or any other change you want to. Uh, the forms start on page uh, what? Well, they're appendix, I think, D2 to the, um, I think it's page 2, 223, 223 of 516. The changes I suggested really weren't substantive by and large, but were a little, I think, and then you're going to have to speak up because I, I can't hear you down here, so I'm sure they can. The changes I suggested were really substantive in nature, or so they were to increase clarity and consistency. And there were a couple questions for consideration. Okay, do you want to from or? Pulling up the red line now. So the first one comes on page 225. Yeah, it's a question about whether we should clarify the type of address being. Second, change that I'm not seeing actually redlined here. <laughs> so let me pull it up here. Oh, yes, yeah, there's red line. If, if you look at the heading, uh, specifically the style, you'll see just a capitalization. And then I don't think it's too helpful to go through all those instances of uh, changes for consistency. They're pretty self explanatory, but on page 229 of the PDF, you'll see a question about whether the phrasing should be a little broader to account for the possibility that there might be more than one facility administrator. 
And on that same page, item 10, there's a modification suggested <laughs> to acknowledge that some people do not have homes. And then on page 230 of the PDF, suggestion to increase clarity in paragraph three, providing a definition of the term reason. Clarification in paragraph four to recognize that the circumstances being referenced are likely in the past. Skimming through to see if there's anything else of note. I don't think there's anything else noteworthy, but uh, uh, Judge Boyce, please let me know if you think there is. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm not sure that we need to ask for a vote specifically on these forms. I think this is more in the back mission than uh, yeah. incorporate uh, into or take consideration of it to whether any tweaks of these forms are warranted. But I, I guess I would extend patient to anybody on advisory if there are additional tweaks or comments that you have now or after today's meeting, want to please write to me or to, to Christy. Uh, and, and yeah, great. Right. Uh, anybody else have any comments right now? Uh, see if we can come up with some language over lunch and yes. uh, rule 10, and then we'll. Uh, Let's uh, finish this one off. Uh, so now we will uh, to remote procedural rules. And uh, Dennis, I think you and Lisa are leading the charge uh, today along with Judge Justice Christopher. Uh, but we have some distinguished uh, guests uh, to speak. I've known them for a long time. I know they're distinguished, but, uh, but take a vote on it. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Kenneth. Well, actually, I'm going to turn it over to start because Lisa heads up the committee of the Texas Access to Justice Commission that her Justice Busby request looked at the proposal specifically pertaining to the Justice Court rules. And I think it makes sense to start with their recommendations response to requests and explanations because essentially what happened, Chip, is that the subcommittee, the remote proceedings task force working on that rule adopted the suggestions from the rules committee of the Texas Access to Justice Commission and then made a few additional changes. Okay. Okay. Well y'all know me. And Justice Christopher has her oh, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, before we get started, Justice Christopher. Oh, sorry. I was uh, I was trying to get Kenan's attention. We really cannot hear her online. Um, Bill Boyce's seat seems to be the best of every seat in the room. Okay. <laughs> so well, he's got a if, microphone in front of him. If funny. I could, you know, we could, if we could see what the issue is, but that was really useful. Bill's, we could hear Bill. Can you hear me now? It's better. Thanks. There's a big microphone in front of me now. Um, that's why. So I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. What's the bottom line of the introductory comments? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, before I get started, because you guys all me and get tired of hearing from me, um, I would like to introduce some of the other members of the Access to Justice Commission who are here. Um, we have our esteemed chair, um, Harriet Myers, who is in person with us today. And then I believe online of uh, some of our uh, access to justice commission professional. I think Trish is on. Catherine and Brianna. Okay, okay. We have Trish, um, Catherine, and Brianna all on. So if I can't answer any questions, um, we have ample resources to uh, answer any questions. Specifically to how remote proceedings have really increased access to justice in the um, We are so grateful to be here. And I'm here anyway, but I as speaking on behalf of the commission, we're happy to be here to present to you 
Um, we were invited really through our liaison, Justice Brett, Brett Busby, who emailed us um, about three weeks ago, maybe six weeks ago, summer's gone too fast, um, and sort of invited our comments specifically on um, three areas um, that are addressed in our report that we sent out this week. Uh, our report is page 429 of the PDF. And we cover three things. First is um, just what is the definition of good cause as it relates to courts. And as we were studying that, we came up with a, a few tweaks to the 500 series that we would recommend. Um, and that proposal is Kevin's proposal. Um, and then, so we tweaked a few things about the rule. Um, we gave um, some um, one of the one of the current proposals that the commission would agree with that the advisory committee has been working on right now is how to give notice to participants about how a how a hearing will be handled handled whether remote or in person <clears throat> and so we have a notice form that we attach to our report uh, that I reread it certainly could be tweaked but it's good information um, and walks um, someone who may not be represented into um, how they're going to get online to participate remotely, if that's the case. Um, and then thirdly, we're asked to provide um, some more data about how remote hearings do increase access to justice for Texans. Um, and we are the beneficiary of a National Center for State Courts report. Um, that studied hours, hours of Texas remote proceedings through the initial part of the pandemic. I believe was eight counties in Texas, and um, came up with some recommendation or some observations about how that went in Texas in Texas counties. And so the last part of our report is attempting to be a summary of how this really does increase access. More people are participating. We are having less defaults in Texas than before. Um, we are, you know, we, we certainly encountered some techno technological problems that we've had to work through, but we have found many solutions for those technological problems. Um, and by and, by and large, um, our position and supported by the data, data that the National Center for State Courts is, our courthouses are open to more Texans when remote proceedings are an option for the system. Um, and so then specifically to the proposed rule, which is on page, here's, at uh, page 310, our large PDF. Um, we, and I'm really looking at page. Okay, it's not red line. Um, okay, so I just I run through some changes. Um, specifically, we recommended and the subcommittee then mostly adopted, and I think Mike Lee on this explicitly adopted, uh, several additional factors in the comment to the 20 pages. Um, we made them more parallel, mostly, because they were, they were not parallel in structure. Um, and then we added a few items, um, which is really well articulated in our report about what we believe each item meant and why we thought it was important as a commission. Um, we removed that the request um, to appear by alternative would need to be filed. Um, 
Judge Chu, and I'm sorry, I did not give credit to our committee members who worked on this at the beginning as I intended to, um, but um, this was an ad hoc group of the commission uh, that included me, Harriet Myers, um, uh, Kenan, Judge Ferguson from West Texas, and uh, Judge Chu, who's a JP in uh, Travis County, uh, as well as our professionals from the mission. Um, and Judge Chu, one of the things he pointed out is that a lot of times when somebody's requesting uh, to appear remotely in his courtroom, it's really just an email to his court coordinator or something. So we just took out the word filing and suggested request. And that is also consistent with what Ken and I have both experienced in Travis County, where often, you know, if the judge has said this is going to be remote or we are in Travis County as well, even in district and county courts, although this is the JP rule, uh, we are, in fact, more likely to communicate directly with a coordinator instead of filing a formal filing. So we changed that. And then, um, I believe that we changed um, the word must to should um, so that it would allow more discretion to trial court um, in uh, implementing the intent of the rule um, with our thought being um, we didn't want a judge to think he has to consider every factor um, and we were trying to avoid a presumption one way or the other and so that was our recommendation which the um, Penn subcommittee also carried forward and then Okay. Okay. So anyway, thank you for um, allowing the Access to Justice Commission appear today. Give our input um, on this rule. We're honored to do so, um, and we um, we're glad to be here and for the four Texans. Mary, do you want to say a few words? Well, let me add my uh, expression of gratitude to for allowing us to come and speak to you because we have been aided information about just the great need of our state and particularly in terms of access to courthouses and access to technology and very um, a large number of impediments that believe it missions charge to try to remove. So uh, if we can appreciate the, the most speedy uh, we can uh, easily uh, more accessible to not just uh, to self litigants and others uh, would be able to uh, access uh, that the work schedule, graphic um, patient, whatever might cause um, um, not to be able to. So we are grateful to the committee for at these rules uh, with respect to the JP courts. Hope that uh, those possible so we can uh, move forward and see how. Uh, and that's what we see. And if you care, thank you for you help the low income Texans across our state. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I, I was told that Brianna Stone uh, is on uh, remotely. Uh, she is with the uh, Texas Access to Justice Commission. And I don't know if she's got remarks or not, but uh, if you've got some, uh, our way. No, sir. I think everybody's handled it quite ably. Thank you very much. 
bet. I love it when they call me sir, too. <laughs> That's a respect I don't usually get around here, uh, Brianna. So well, Brianna deserves so much credit for this report uh, and for our work um, that we did on drafting the rule. Um, so thank you. If I can say it here while everybody's. Uh, thank you, Lisa. I just want to say it's actually Catherine Ibarra who did this particular report. Um, I mean, we tag team, but she's the main force. So I just want to make sure she gets the credit. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, do we want to uh, talk about this rule or um, what, what's your question, Kenneth? I want to talk about it more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't let it go, can you? No, no, I mean, I, I do think it would be helpful um, for me to quickly summarize what the, the subcommittee of the task force did in addition to the chief uh, that Lisa discussed just now. Um, specifically, one thing that we did in addition to the commission's work is to modify the open courts notice provisions in subpart D of proposed rule 500.10. Uh, as drafted last time when we looked at it, stated if the court proceeding is conducted away from the court's usual location, the court must provide reasonable notice to the public. Away from the station, an opportunity for the public to observe the proceeding. As it stands now, it's been broadened and simplified to state well, the court must provide reasonable notice to the public how to observe court proceedings, period. And the rationale for that is laid out in the memo, but, but really it's we believe that the public should be informed of how to observe the court proceedings, whether in person or remote. And two, we already have constitutional and statutory provisions that address where a judge must be when presiding over court proceedings. And I'm happy to give an overview of the research on that particular question. If anybody here wants it at the bottom line, that we think that should be left to the Constitution and the statute as opposed to being reiterated or summarized in the rule. Great. Great. Uh, any comments uh, from the committee on the uh, proposed new rule 500.2G? What a comment. Yeah, Robert. That this goes back to some of the prior discussions in terms of whether the presumption that the Proceeding would take place in the court. And particularly to the extent and look at attachment B that this would apply to district court. But if we're just talking about the justice court, that there is a standard that it would take place physically. But if it can you know, propose language change, the suggestion would be that would be no presumption. The other reference that I was struck by is that under this rule change, I, if I understood it, that you would have to um, list, or would have to list for every notice of how to appear whether remotely or in person. So any proceeding is scheduled, you would have to, if it was going to be in the courtroom, you'd have to say it would take place in the courtroom. And that what was intended. I think you're referring to subpart C of the proposed rule 5.10 is that right, Robert? The B, did you say B? The C. Right. <clears throat> yes. Every every notice would have to have that language. That is the intent. And I'll, I'll give a quick anecdote because I think it might be helpful. Here. After giving a recent CLE presentation on remote proceedings, somebody in the audience came up to me after it and said, you know, I've been practicing since 20, the entire time. I've 
practicing, I've been appearing and I just assumed that's what I was supposed to do for recent hearing. And then realized that the notice didn't tell me I had to be the person that I was supposed to be the person. The judge got very upset with me and wondered how on earth I could not assume I was supposed to be the person that I've been practicing Zoom my whole career. So the assumption seemed fair to me. Um, but, but really beyond that, uh, Robert, the discussion at the subcommittee level and also uh, from the Justice Court Working Group participated in this drafting, and this language goes back to that time, was that people need to know how to appear. And because that could be remote, they need to know the Zoom link for that. Um, because it could be in person, they need to know that they should have in person. So yes, the idea was to spell it out in the notes. So question then, this language is a must language. Um, but a part, let's say a judge doesn't believe in remote at all. He just puts the notice to hear take place. The failure to do that is a defect in, in the pool. Um, would that be a substantive reason to challenge the ruling? I guess Obviously, the appeal of Justice Court ruling is de novo to anyone. Not sure in all cases. Um, do we want to have a substantive defect built rule? Because my experience, obviously, is normally wouldn't put room number the hearing to work, stating it really in person. I think the question that you're posing is whether much modified to say should. Um, and that frankly isn't something I recall a debate around at the subcommittee level. Uh, I think it'd be good to have committee discussion about it. I will note, I learned from participating in this process and having learned justice courts is that issuing the notes there. So this is going to be not parties like I draft my notices, file it. It's going to be the court doing it. So one thing I have to keep in mind when we have this conversation, if we have it, is that the courts will be doing this, the justice court, judges, and they're obviously going to be trained, continue to be trained on, on what to do. So, and I'm not expecting the court, but like for interaction is it always the court that sends out the notice would it be the movement that would do it i don't know the that question i can tell you my understanding from judge Chu that the courts are issuing the notices and the jp but i don't want to speak definitively because like you i don't have as much experience as courts and county courts Uh, sorry, uh, John. Um, Judge was first. I was just going to respond. We did discuss this a little bit in one of the subcommittee zooms that we had about it, and I was one of the ones arguing that either way, whether it's in person or remote, it should tell you how to appear because it's a four seventieth district court. I don't believe that gives due process. No, everybody who doesn't, that a lawyer doesn't know where the four seventieth court is, so they get their hearing notice says 470th district court, it requires them to do another step of Googling the 470th district court to figure out where that is. And so both for remote proceedings and also for just increasing due process and consistency and all of that, it's important to really give a party notice of how they can appear in their court hearings. So for example, I get on our um, DA's office about this or final trial notices Yes, cases they don't have the address of the courthouse and i'm like you're going to terminate all rights and didn't tell them the address where to show up so i do believe it's important whether it's in person or remote that you give the person information about how to participate in their court hearing john hold on for one second i'm skip judge schaefer uh judge schaefer sorry it's okay uh again i just want to reiterate that we're having trouble hearing anyone except for the microphone Judge Miskell is using, which I presume is next to Judge Boyce. Um, 
so I don't know if what I'm about to raise has been discussed or not, but in, in deciding on whether or not these rules should be implemented, are we considering having rules for remote proceedings? Uh, and by that, I mean cameras on, video on, video off, uh, and things of that nature. So I'll jump in because expressly decided to leave that stuff out of the rule, but we had talked about there are a number of bodies working on best practices. So uh, the National Center for State Courts is working on publishing best practices for remote I believe Texas also has a group working on this. So the thinking was we wouldn't incorporate those best practices into the rule, but we would publish them and then teach the Texas Center for the Judiciary or the JP training groups or whatever it might be. And do it that way was our expectation. Uh, John Morgan and then Justice Crowley. Okay, just, just a couple of things as it relates to um, remote proceeding notices. The address of the courthouse is always included on the paper notice. The address of the courthouse should be included in an electronic notice as well, so that the, anybody who wished to come will know exactly where to go. If you are scheduling a, whether it's a team or a Zoom court proceeding, once you put it on that calendar, the link is automatically there. So a person would know if, if they don't see the link, then they would know that it's a Person, person meeting if, it, if the link is there. But it could be that um, a, lot, a lot of people aren't as technically savvy as others. So it could be that it may just say change in the language in person. A lot of the notices, the majority of the notices that we use are actually generated through our case management system. It's just a matter of changing the words. And you don't, you don't have to do it every time there's a hearing. If you're going to select an in-person, you have to notice automatically do that and it's not something that's changed every day it's a once a once set up and once you set it up then that's something that you use on a basis so i think it's just a matter of the court actually the court staff or the clerk staff actually just making those changes and they're and they're in place thank you hey, I think the remote people that answers your question <laughs> <laughs> I think you're by your silence. And... Apparently, you can't hear me. I thought that you might scream. Any other comments? Because I, I would just propose a, maybe a threshold vote or question. My view is that we establish in-person proceedings and we should presumptively appear in person unless judge rules otherwise. I would propose that the rule be changed the presumption that it would be us determination it's made to the contrary. I, I do, I am troubled with the idea that it or proponent of access certain and there are very many circumstances, particularly in the justice courts where it would be appropriate, but I still think that we Preference. 
I think this this language says it is totally up to the judge, and um, unless there's a statutory obligation to the contrary, the judge could hold their proceedings remotely, and that would be fine. And I, I'm troubled by that. Just think that there is a, a should be a preference to hearing in a courtroom, or we have courtrooms. Um, and there might be reasons no remote, but yeah. threshold, the standard should be in person. So you. Yes. Yes. Don't look at me. <laughs> I, would, I mean, I just feel like we're taking two steps back. Um, I think this is what we've been talking about for three and weeks. Maybe from right now, but I just feel like that is a discussion that is in a way consistent with the special I apologize if we have voted this issue. Then we don't think we voted on this particular thing. To death. <laughs> I think that was the response. It hasn't been voted on, but it has been discussed. Yeah. And I will note Genesis no, we did borrow some language from the emergency order, and I just can't remember what the latest one says, but I can pull it. Thank you. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> we're, we're having some funny comments on uh, our chat about how uh, this is a good example of a Zoom meeting going awry, uh, because it is. Uh, we cannot hear what uh, the vast majority of people are saying in the room, and uh, for that, I'm very sorry. I wish I could have been there in person. Obviously, when um, hearings are happening by Zoom and something like this happens, the hearing has to be stopped, reset, Whatever, I understand that you all don't wanna do that, that's fine. <laughs> but just, just, just so you know that those of us out here in Zoom land do not hear what is going on. And uh, I totally agree with what I think Kenan said, or maybe Judge Miskell, was that we are going backwards to take a vote uh, uh, on uh what robert suggested although i'm not exactly sure exactly what robert suggested because i could only hear about three words of what he was actually suggesting so um i do feel like those of us on uh, the remote proceedings today are at a big disadvantage <laughs> in being able to participate um i i would also just there, there was one point i did hear uh, which is, is notice a substantive issue? And absolutely it is. It is a substantive issue. And there's already a case out there where, you know, the judge said, uh, sent out a Zoom notice and the person couldn't get on Zoom and um, tried to change it. And the judge didn't see the request to change. All right. Well, it got reversed. Yes. So notice is substantive. Notice uh, uh, and, and to say that you, how difficult it is to say that the notice is going to be in the, you know, 295th courtroom at 201 Caroline in Houston, Texas, that is not a difficult thing to put in your notice. 
thank you. And sorry for my uh, unhappiness with not being able to hear what's going on. <laughs> okay, she's shaking her head now. So she said justice voice. If, if this is the microphone that everyone can hear, I'm happy to be the Vanna White of today. <laughs> Chief Justice Christopher, can you hear me now? There's something about this magical area right here. It's Bill Boyce. <laughs> Please speak directly into the judge. <laughs> can you hear me, Chief Justice Christopher? Well, here's uh, here's what the uh, uh, as suggested, uh, that we take an early lunch break uh, and that they uh, try to fix this uh, problem. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to do our record really dramatically. If we, don't, if we don't try to fix it anyway. So uh, why don't we take an hour uh, lunch break back at 10 minutes after one. Probably didn't hear that, but we're going to lunch. <laughs> okay. Take your lunch break, come back at 110. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to show you. If we need to have somebody.